if, if you make prefer, sure we're yeah. clear um, and concise, but I'm, I'm grateful to be here, so thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming. So what did you accept to do it? <laughs> Well, well I, I mean, did, did David like, like, threaten you? No, I like David. I think David is like a fresh. I'm I'm new here too, okay, so okay. we're both kind of new. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think new is is dangerous, but also productive. Yeah. And also exciting and kind of mysterious. And uh, I'm I'm just grateful for the invitation. So that's I don't know. I mean, I like you. So. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why not do it? Yeah, let's see how today goes. Maybe by the end of the year. Oh, no. Do you have questions, Pratt? Have you been stalking yeah. me? Is that what um, that's right. I, actually, sometimes I forget that you're new at the school. You have the persona of someone who's been here for a very long time and is is is, is older. I don't know how old you are, but you have that, that kind of aura about you. But you're, this is your first year at, at Woodbury as well. Yeah, I've been here for a year and a half. Oh, a year and a half. Okay. Oh, okay. So I, I started... Um, uh, I guess back in January of last year. I was also teaching at SciArc. Okay. And then I came full time in August. I've been gotcha. here kind of the assistant chair and also taking on more classes. So it'll be one year in August is a kind of full full time thing. So being assistant chair, it seems like you and Heather, who's the chair, are you guys are just running around constantly putting out fires and creating new things and it, it seems like chaos. How difficult is that position? Because you have to teach full time in addition to doing that administration work yeah it's it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah uh, I, I, were you were you like an assistant chair or anything in that you know more administrative level before no this is something new to me um, uh, I'm very interested in, in design education obviously and in, in teaching and things like that so I've always been interested in understanding that side of okay. academia which I don't think a lot of teachers and designers really get a chance to see and so mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I took it on was to get exposed to that way of working I'm extremely grateful to Heather I mean the, the whole reason I'm here is because of her and I think uh, for me I'm just here to support her in, in whatever she needs mm -hmm. and yeah. so she's been she's been doing a fantastic job with the school trying to kind of cultivate something new and I get to be along for the ride which is which is great but it has been a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> so what are the other classes you're, you're having to teach other than the, the chair work, assistant chair work? So I teach two studios. One of them is like a vertical. It's like a topic studio. So it's a kind of like um, uh, fifth year or last semester grad students. Mm. Um, and that happens in the fall. And then I also teach a kind of thesis prep or degree project prep where it's a kind of um, preparation for their thesis or final semester. And then the following semester, which is this semester, I teach that studio, which we just wrapped up. Um, which is a kind of thesis. I, I had a hybrid between both undergraduate, graduate, and graduate students. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but as of right now, those are the three classes I teach during the school year, and I'm going to possibly teaching a studio this summer. Actually, with Heather, we're going to teach a, a studio together. Oh, cool! Which should be fun. Which studio? Uh, it's 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 more of like a, a transfer st uh, studio. It's a it's a kind of a fourth year, um, kind of like a topic studio again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, some students are transferring in, some students who need to take a studio, some students, oh, okay. you know, it's a, it's a mixture of students, which is really exciting yeah. because you get a kind of diverse group of people, which yeah. is fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the thesis here, it's I've heard it called a number of different things. It's degree and slash thesis is kind of, it seems like an interesting area to operate within. And so the first semester is dedicated to preparing for the next semester, but it's it's officially dedicated that way. It's not like with both her studios, but we were just using the studio the first semester to do research. The first semester is actually dedicated that, to that kind of work. Is that right? Yeah. I, I think degree project is specific to undergraduate studies, and thesis is specific to grad. I think the only reason, I think undergrads, they see it as a kind of thesis, even though the terminology would be a degree yeah. project. Right. Which I, I think it's more geared towards buildings, mm -hmm. right? And then a thesis maybe can go beyond a building, which I think is specific to the grad students. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a kind of thesis prep which is really, um, or a, a kind of research uh, methodology that you're working on in the fall. Um, and that directly leads into the this, this spring semester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of nice in a way, because I remember for my undergrad, it, it was called thesis, right? And uh, you had studio with one professor the entire year, and all of it was studio. But we all understand you dedicate the first quarter to kind of research. but. There's the, the kind of tension between the tension from knowing that it's supposed to be a studio and yet you're doing, you know, a bunch of research. And I feel like it'd be 
kind of nice psychologically to, to say to yourself, yeah, okay, I'm dedicating this semester to, to investigating certain things. And they might have some uh, design kind of proposals and some, some things happening in the works, but I'm going to really hit the ground you know, uh, in the spring. Yeah, I, I think there's something kind of serious about these, as, especially in architecture. Yeah. Um, I think we do that to ourselves. Mm. I think there's projects and individuals in the past who have uh, set a precedent. Uh, I think uh, you know the, the seriousness of, of let's say um, someone like Zaha Hadid or um, Preston Scott Cohen or um, uh, even like Habitat 67 being built from a thesis. Uh, Philip Johnson built his thesis at Harvard. I think this, there's a kind of seriousness to to the thesis, and so for some students it becomes this this thing, yeah. right? That's not really um as big as as maybe they think it is but they make it really really big yeah um but I, I think it's really important to have thesis there's a lot of schools who don't have thesis um yeah we were talking you know, about this with uh, someone else sometimes they call it a capstone project I mean terminology kind of you know, how it's used is varied but I, I've heard that term and I guess in place of a thesis it's more or like you're just doing like what well, we would have a comprehensive studio it's like an ultra comprehensive studio is like what the capstone project is meant to be as opposed to a thesis, I guess. Is that? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the capstone, I don't know, I guess it goes back to a kind of pedagog pedagogical standpoint on, on academia and what the role is uh, for the institution. Um, I know UCLA got rid of their kind of thesis. Yeah. It's more of like a capstone thing, and I, I guess it's working fine for them. Uh, other schools, like let's say SIARC, or I was just at USC this past week for reviews, there's a kind of... Um, a kind of spirit to the thesis, mm -hmm. um, which is embedded into the body of the school and the kind of way, ways in which things people are working on problems. Um, but I think it just depends. I think here at Woodbury, it's still very specific to um, a degree project, just because we don't have, our our undergraduate program is is so much more. Um, uh, I guess there's more there's more undergraduate students, so it becomes more more work happening at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think it's fabulous. I think we should have thesis everywhere. <laughs> How is it on the East Coast? Do people have thesis? In like, I guess does Harvard have a thesis or? I don't know about don't Harvard know. actually. Yale, the, the, Columbia. The, the only school I was exposed to was a four-year program. Uh, I mean, exposed to directly was a four-year. So it's kind of a different ballgame at that point. Um, I'd be curious. I mean, I'm on board with the idea of thesis. I think it's 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 a good way to to both uh, conclude a five-year program and also open up new doors. Because it seems like for most people who are dedicated to their work, the thesis is is almost a, a lot of times more valuable in that way, it, in, in that it broadens their view to, to new things and helps them figure out what they want to do after school or if they're going to go to a master's or continue on with what they're researching. It's like the first step into uh, a topic that they take really seriously. And I think that opportunity is pretty great to have, <laughs> you know, depending on the kind of student you are, I suppose. I think um, it's important for architecture, too. I mean, just as a kind of way of working on problems throughout your entire life. I think you have to, <laughs> yeah. you have to as, as, as academics, I think you have to create a spark in students to sustain a kind of um, passion for what they're doing. Um, and maybe that's where thesis comes into play, is because it's kind of the last semester of, of your academic career, but it's the first kind of transition to your professional career. Maybe that's where all the magic happens, mm -hmm, right? That's mm -hmm. the thing that lives on for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's it's a it's a privilege to be a part of it here at the school. Um, I, I think uh, Mark Erickson, who was the coordinator for the degree project this year, did a fantastic job. I think organizing it and putting it together. We just opened our big currents exhibition, and then the degree projects are up right now. And so just walking through the school and seeing all the work, um, it's really I think compelling to see the kind of serious output from the <coughs> students. Yeah. Um, it's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, there's some good stuff happening. <laughs> um, but your own education, you you didn't do an undergraduate in architecture, correct? I, this, is, this is my cursory like Wikipedia research on our guests. It's a little, yeah. So so I, I actually did I did a, a double major. So I did I do have an undergraduate in architecture, but I also have an undergraduate in art studio. Wow. An art studio. Yeah. Hmm. Um, the core classes were in graphic design. It's a BA in art studio, okay. which is a kind of um, bachelor's, just in a kind of general head of studio. And then I also got a bachelor's uh, in, uh, or BA in architecture, which is a four-year degree. So I started undergrad not going into architecture. <laughs> right. I told myself I was not going to go into architecture, uh, even though my parents 
uh, they really want, they thought it'd be good if I went to architecture. I said, no, I'm not going into architecture. Wait, I, this is a rare story. I think <laughs> usually parents are like, don't, don't do architecture. <laughs> why, why did they want you to do, to do architecture? Uh, this, I guess this is a strange, strange story. This is something I was, um, uh, given to, I was, <laughs> this is funny. So, so apparently the night that, um, uh, my, my mother's water broke when, um, she had to go to the hospital. She was, you know, she was, was going to give birth to me. Um, my dad was having a dream, and he saw my name on a building. What? <laughs> really? And so they always thought I was going to be an architect. Really? So they always said, "Well, son, when 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 you were born, I had a dream that night, and I saw your name in a building, and I think you should do architecture." <laughs> and so they invested a lot of money into, you know, um, uh, drawing, painting courses. Um, building tools. They, so they were pretty serious about this. I, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a serious thing. I, I don't think it was like, oh, we were going to control your future. I think it was just um, they were going with their their gut instinct. I don't, I don't know. Right. Um, and so there was always this kind of architectural conversation happening as I was growing up. And then when you get into high school, you're like, no, I don't want to do anything my parents are telling me. And so when I got into college, I ended up going into arts arts school. Mm -hmm. um, and then after a year, it just so happened my first roommate was in architecture school, and I said, "Oh no, I have to go to architecture school." <laughs> you caved. I caved. It's, it's I, meant I, to realized, be. I realized, okay, this is what I should be doing, and so um, I ended up transferring into the architecture program the second year. And then my counselor said, "Well, you've already finished half of your art degree um, courses. Right. Why don't you just finish it?" Yeah. So basically, uh, I was an undergrad for six years. And all my summers were filled up with art studio, and then all the, the spring and fall was, was filled with architecture studios. And so I finished with uh, two bachelors and a minor. Holy smokes. Oh, yeah. in, in four years? In six years. In six years. Yeah. That's still wow. banging out a lot of classes. Yeah. So what was what is an art studio uh, major? I'm not super familiar with it. Is it is it a like broad? So there's there's a there's a, a BFA, which is a Bachelor of Fine Art. Right, that's like a five-year. It's equivalent to like a, a B, like a bachelor's of architecture, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a four-year architecture program, which is a kind of BA. So there's something similar in art, which is like a BA in art studio with a concentration. Okay. Um, so all my core classes were in graphic design, so a, a lot of typography and layout and things like that. So that's super I'll, helpful to architecture. It is. It's yeah, funny. Yeah. I, I think that, that when looking back on it, you kind of realize everything adds up to something. Yeah. Um, and, and it, I think that, and also I got a minor in art history. I think art history had a huge influence on the way I think about things. Art in general, I think, is very important for architecture. Mm. Um, they're very different, but I, I think the kind of the history is, and the seriousness of artists, I think, bleeds over into architecture, and it's good to be exposed to that um, if you can. Yeah. Um, but the but I, at the end of the day, I, I say I'm, I went to school for architecture. I think the the art thing was a kind of um, a secondary thing that was happening in my life. It was still very much about kind of architecture. So the art history minor, when did you decide to do that? It was it was just because I think um, I just kept taking classes. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you know, if you, you know, I just I just kept taking more and more classes and by the t by the last year, by year 5, they said, "Well, I mean, you could this is what you could have. You could have two two degrees and a minor." I said, "Let's do it." Right. Um, but I was just really interested in knowledge. I was so hungry for information. I went to, to Rome when I was a student. It changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, going to Rome and uh, living there for a couple months um, and get, getting to see, I think, the history of architecture, which is the history of civilization. You, you realize that you can cultivate yourself into any type of person you want to be. And, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm an academic is it's, it motivates me to help people find themselves. And I felt like I found myself, I think, right. going through the different programs. Um, but I, ha I have an affinity for, for art and art history. And I, I, still, I still index that uh, daily in my work. So is that something, I know it's kind of hard to categorize what came first, but I'm kind of curious. So it, the art and, and art history was the initial few years in a way, and then it bled over to architecture. And if that's the case, I'm wondering, um, I mean, you just said it, but in, in what ways did that help you during your time at school or now in architecture? Or did it give you advantages or different insights? <clears throat> There's something very um, rigorous about architecture school, right? I think like repetition and redoing things over and over again, um, line weights, uh, craft, um, not really knowing what you're doing and professors not really telling you what you're doing, but you still have to do it. There's a kind of mystery to it. Art school is completely different. 
Hmm. Right? It's kind of messy, um, creative. Um, uh, there's a kind of playfulness to it that I think is is uh, was beneficial for for me. Um, and I think studying like things like contemporary art history, especially in the '60s and '70s, and just the kind of personalities of artists and how they were acting, and knowing that you know the architect is this kind of professional who's very rigid, right. and and the artist is someone who's who's kind of serious, but serious in a kind of strange way. Right. Um, and I think both of those simultaneously uh, helped. Uh, cultivate who I am today. Even though I think in undergrad, you still really don't understand what you're doing. Like you don't understand what architecture is. I think even today, as you move through your kind of career as an architect, you, f you still fully don't understand it. Um, and if someone tells you that they do, they're probably lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, it was it was strange just because in 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 art school, students don't stay in in art studio as much as architecture students stay in studio. Hmm. Um, you can get away with with procrastinating for two or three weeks, and then like the week before your art assignment is due, you can actually go and do the work. Uh, architecture school, you can't do that, yeah. right? You need you need two months to like finish everything. So I spent more time in the architecture school mm. than I did in the art school. I would only go to the art school, which is actually it was across the quad in my undergrad. So I'd, I'd walk across the quad, I'd go to class, and then I'd go to art studio to check my art, and then I'd go back to architecture school, <laughs> and I would I, that was basically my my life for four years. Right. Um, but we don't we don't talk about art as much. I feel like in architecture, not anymore. really. No, I think right now it's, it's about technology weird. and yeah. data and like uh, machine vision, um, new tools, um, trying to kind of understand what's happening within all the noise <laughs> that's taking place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe we need to get back into it. Maybe we need uh, to. I, I think. It. I mean, I can. I fully understand why we would have as a whole community a uh, uh, an intense focus and interest in the things you mentioned. But I think any time there is a, a new wave of technology or a new wave of doing things, or we perceive it as being new, a lot of times they're not actually new, um, that we kind of just put all our chips into that. And it's, it's on the one hand very exciting, because it it's, will lead to new things, I'm sure of it, but it's also uh, very concerning, um, at least for me, because I, I don't, if there's too much group think in one, in one direction, I'm always wondering, Okay, well, what what are we missing? What's in the rear view mirror that we've not seen that we sh we should be looking at? You know, so uh, it's an interesting point. Yeah. So you mean like from a historical standpoint, like what's what's how are we defining the current historical standpoint, or even I mean, you know, the real tough thing I think with with architecture or teaching architecture is that there's so much to cover. There's like so much to cover, and there's not a whole even five years. Five years is a pretty long time for an undergraduate degree. It's still not enough time, right? And so, so it, it could be things like, like you know, framing what we're doing now in a larger context, or just methods of making, or if we're only producing stuff, uh, physical models, let's say specifically, using X tools, and we're not doing anything by hand to play this kind of devil's advocate, then are we missing something from that? So, it's it's, uh, and and I think it's a, it's an almost an unsolvable question in a way because architecture is all encompassing, and that's what makes it. I think a forever a puzzle and interesting to, to be a part of. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I I hand drafted in undergrad, mm. right? I mean, I remember doing like gouache paintings, and wire studies, and watercolor, and chipboard and basswood and all those things. And um, we were our our class was rec we were the first generation, the first year in architecture school that would require a computer. Yeah, same with us. Same with yeah. me. This is like two thousand five or two thousand six, something like that. It was like we ended up. Everyone got a MacBook Pro or something. Okay, I think we were the same exact year then. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was like uh, a MacBook Pro. I forget, like the very first one or something. It was a like big deal. Yeah, had, like dual really... core in a, in a laptop. I had a PC. <laughs> yeah. uh, you had a PC. Yeah, I had a PC. Um, Very sense, but... <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, PCs are better for for architecture. Yeah, they <laughs> crash a lot. This they have the... lots of viruses. <laughs> well, I think like AutoCAD and and yeah. um, you know the Autodesk, they they run better on PC. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, the creatives, right? The the kind of misfits use the. The Max in some ways. Well, the the the, the art schools too use the Max. Huh? Yeah, and I think that's because of the Adobe products. I mean, I use Mac because right. I, I make films sometimes, mm -hmm. and then I also use the Adobe. But then there's also the architecture tools. So, for me, Mac is a kind of it's a it has everything. Yeah. Um, but I guess it just depends. But it looks nice. It it's look nice. Well, I'm a Mac person now. <laughs> <laughs> I get converted. <laughs> 
Um, uh, but you're saying what we're talking about? Yeah, we're talking about we're talking about like the tools and techniques, right? Or like, right, it's right, the right. tools. So so the, the hand drawing versus the kind of digital, just digital kind of thing. Um, I always ask myself like, what are the subjectivities now in in 2019 that haven't found a place? In architecture yet and I think maybe that's the answer to the question is maybe it's okay to not reuse the past to, mm. to look at the future um, at least I'm, I'm comfortable with with that at the end of the day you can never learn everything mm. right but I think it's up to us as let's say academics or in this case Heather's job or whoever's in charge of the school to kind of cultivate one a way of working but also a kind of pedagogical stance on uh, what what we think architecture is today and so if, if we think that you need to have, you know, uh, T-square and pencils and watercolors, then it should be included. If we, if we don't, then it shouldn't, mm. right? And I think it depends on the people who are in the positions to, to help facilitate those decisions. Um, but I, I appreciate it. I like hand drafting. <laughs> I kind of miss it. <laughs> Wait, so do you still take classes it, for yourself or...? No. You, no, I guess I guess I wish you because you have spare time. time <laughs> well, it, or, in some know? ways, like the teaching is is a, I get a way for me to learn. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. um, I do a lot of prep before each one of my classes. I never teach the same studio twice. Okay. So every year, I always every semester, I try and write a new syllabus. <clears throat> um, and so in a way, I, I I learn new things then. Yeah. But I don't have time for classes. <laughs> <laughs> I would be nice. Yeah. It'd be really nice. Yeah. So, how much hand drafting did you do in school? And that was was that part of your architecture education, or more for the art side? Because I, I think that our stories might be similar in that we both probably came, all three of us probably came into undergraduate around the same time, and it was the first wave of computers, and it was there's this uh, wonderful or, or terrible tension between these two kind of analog versus digital sides, as as, as everyone perceived it that way, and um, at the time hand drafting, doing ink on mylar, and using like a razor blade to clean up the corners and all the stuff was still being pushed. And I loved it at the time, I don't regret doing it, but you do have to wonder like how, how much of it do we have to, is it necessary to buy a T-square and do ink on mylar? I don't know. I don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, at, least, at least for me, I think um, architecture school is, is about teaching people how to teach themselves. <clears throat> Um, but it's also about being exposed to different techniques and tools. Um, and so like, yes, there's Rhino and there's a lot of things you can do, but like, how do you use it? Right? So do you use grasshopper? Do you use figuration, projection, Boolean operations? Uh, do you make 2D and draw everything? Um, like there's so many different endless, um, ways of working. And I think for, for architecture school, it's, it's, you should be very specific. Mm. Um, in, in showing like, tutorials and, and tools and techniques and, and, and processes. Um, uh, I always tell my students, like, if you're spending more than 30 minutes on something, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> um, and, it, and not to say that there's plenty of tasks in architecture that take hours and take a, a kind of focus, but I think one of, the, one of the challenges students face is understanding how to get from point A to point B. And sometimes they do it like instead of um, arraying Right, they'll just like copy and then copy, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. copy, and you, step by step. And you like, you need, you, let's say you need two thousand of them, and they don't realize like, oh, there's an array command, yeah. like yeah. little things yeah. like that. I think is we should be really we, we're responsible for that and how you how you teach it. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think I would go back to hand drafting. I just don't think it's it's our it's it's a different generation now, um, and there it's all about the computer. And I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should go back to, to hand. I mean, there's a lot of robots making like hand drawings. Like yeah, it's super drawings. weird yeah. to see. Um, but there's a kind of immediate immediacy in our culture now, where to spend 40 hours on a on an elevation done by hand, it's very different than spending like four hours on an elevation that you can produce in Rhino and then plot. Yeah. Um, but maybe there's like a kind of poetic and also a kind of conceptual notion to that type of work. The well, and, and dedication too. I feel like if you're gonna spend forty hours draw, drawing an elevation, you're really gonna think about every single thing that you're drawing because you're deliberately with your hand making that decision, right? Like I feel like the, I, I love the digital, but oftentimes there is gestures or choices that have been made on like half a second just because they had to be made at that point, mm. and. 
people use, you know, the fact that, oh, it's because I'm using this technology. Well, no, you know, it doesn't erase the ownership on the decisions that you're taking for that design. So I think there still needs to be some kind of, of balance and that people should still feel that, you know, they have responsibility using those tools. Yeah. yeah. No, and I've, I've, heard, I've heard that criticism, which is like an affair... Uh, valid criticism that you can't really understand something unless you kind of work through it. Yeah. But um, I mean, in some ways, uh, the way that we produce architecture now is like speed dating, yeah. right? You're kind of swiping, uh, like I like this, I don't like that. I like That's this. a good so, analogy, yeah. yeah. And it's 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 the whole thing. Like I don't know what I want, but I know it when I see it, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. Um, I think as designers, you have to be comfortable with saying, okay, I've been doing this for this amount of time, and at this point, I'm okay with this is the decision I'm making. Right. Because um, at the end of the day, that's still a choice. Even if it was a second versus a 40-hour <laughs> yeah. endeavor, it's, yeah. still a, it's still a choice. And whether or not it's wrong or right, it's still a kind of decision. I think decision-making is very important for all of this. Um, but yeah, I don't... I don't I don't. I don't mind that students just kind of accidentally work in the computer, and they say, "Well, I, I came across this thing," and then let's post rationalize. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it in relationship to the history of architecture. Let's talk about it in the relationship to its kind of formal characteristics. Let's talk about it and how we can use it functionally or programmatically, and then maybe you go back and you post rationalize. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's, uh, yeah. Um, I, I worked at uh, at an office, and uh, they worked with a lot of physical models. Um, and the models themselves would be, become the kind of progenitors for the buildings. And you would realize like how arbitrary or just kind of sudden someone would take a piece of paper and some hot glue mm -hmm. and then put it on the model. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, it gets put into a, a CD set. <laughs> and then six <laughs> months later, you're like, oh, that was like something I didn't really think about. That happens all the time, I think, in yeah. the building industry is there's just not enough time to, to kind of think. This is true. About yeah. every little yeah. detail. So uh, I'm going to guess that that was Gary's office? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> It's cool. What was it like working there? It was great. It was fantastic. Um, I love the people, love the culture. It's I, only positive things about that office. I learned so much about building. Um, in some ways, that was kind of a, a post um, education experience, mm -hmm. right? So maybe maybe architecture school is about like tools, uh, techniques, history, foundation, uh, ways of thinking, and then after. When you work in an office, that's another set of education, right? Which deals yeah. with like uh, clients and codes and program, um, all the steps and phases of the construction process, from concept design to um, construction administration. Um, and I think you start to like working on stairs for eight months or bathroom <laughs> for six months. Yeah. You learn a lot about <laughs> details in these types of you know this conversation going to the kind of hand yeah, drafting yeah, yeah. thing, which I'm very grateful for. Um, oh, I'm grateful for digital technology to draft <laughs> bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know how, how, how they worked without XREFs <laughs> back back in the day. I don't know. I mean, when you look at a full CD set that was hand drawn, it kind of it blows oh, your mind. It's like it's this amazing. Is, isn't this it? is crazy, and everything's perfect. The lettering's perfect. It's like this is. <laughs> I don't know if I could have done that. Like, but then if you go back even further, you know, people are building crazy buildings without even having plans yeah, or understand. elevation. But you know, what, I, I feel like the digital. Uh, uh, progression in architecture has caused uh, a kind of immediacy that is, is toxic for the culture. So, like, if the structural engineer sent you a letter back in the '70s or something, or maybe before that, the '50s, um, you couldn't update the drawing overnight, <laughs> right? We're like now, if you if you, you could be like on a deadline, like, oh, we're going to print tomorrow, and then the en engineer or someone, a consultant, says, oh, we have an update. And then people stay all night, yeah. right? And they just slave. And that's, I mean, that's a, a kind of typical thing. That's a, that's a very common thing. And it's, it's always going to be around this kind of deadline culture. Um, but, but I don't know if it's a good thing. <laughs> that, it, well, there's definitely the perception that, like, because we have this technology, that we can push that deadline, be closer to the deadline. But, you know, that doesn't work that way. Because there's invariably always problems with technical things or printing doesn't work. It just, it, it's a bad call to operate that way. And everyone we've talked to who has successful businesses, they're like, no, I have strict yeah. times where I'm working and strict times where I'm off. Mm -hmm. And if a client calls during the weekend, I do not pick up because it just leads down toward a, a rabbit hole of problems. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's kind of up to us to set the rules now that we have more freedom, um, which is a tough thing to do sometimes, I feel like. It's a there's a very there's a there's a big gap between academia and the profession I think right now and they're both they both have their problems but also their benefits. Hmm. Um, 
and that's definitely a kind of problem I think for the for the practice the fact that there is a, a gap, gap between the two? Well, the gap, but also, um, I mean, like, working on architecture is very different than working on buildings. Buildings is extremely cl collaborative, tons of money. There's <laughs> clients, there's cities, there's codes. Um, architecture can be very selfish. It can be you in a room working on something, right. whether it's through a drawing or a model or text or the design of a building idea. Um, buildings are a different s subject. Mm. Um, in architecture and it, it goes beyond I think what any of us do in, in academia mm. which have their own set of problems yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's it's so much fun I don't know <laughs> it's like it's amazing like well, so are you still practicing or are you basically teaching full time working, working I would consider myself uh, more in the teaching realm I mean I'm, I'm very clear when people ask me like oh do you want to have a firm or practice and absolutely yes Um, I think if you look at the career of the architect, um, maybe right now I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. I'm in my 30s. I think that, um, uh, well, l let me step back and, and say this then. So, um, like when you get out of, when you get into school, right, you're introduced to like drawings and models and history and books and you work on models and there's ideas, right? And then when you get out, um, at least for me, I'm really interested in exhibitions, uh, installations, Um, maybe pavilions, mm. right? And so I've been working on exhibitions and curating and things like that over the past couple of years. I think the next thing I'm really interested in working on is uh, maybe mock-ups or like things that are bigger than a model but like not big enough to inhabit kind of thing, the kind of physicality of things. Um, and then as you move on, maybe you'll do interiors, then you'll do a house, then you'll do an office building, then you'll do a, a, a kind of maybe a museum or a skyscraper and then eventually a city and then hopefully by the end of it it gets all put into a monograph which gets put back into a book and then it goes restarts <laughs> it's like the circle of life for the architect oh, you thought it out the next oh, yeah, 60 you know. years for everyone I think, I think there's finish. projects that are very specific to where you are in your architectural yeah. career yeah um, I, I think I would guarantee if someone graduated from architecture school and got the commission to do a skyscraper it'd probably be a really bad building be a bad idea. I just, you, you just, yeah. you can't make critical decisions about uh, how you want to position something until you yeah. go through these phases. So right now, uh, I would say no, even though I do get commissions to do work for yeah. things, um, uh, I'm not interested in doing buildings right now. I would love to in maybe 10, 15 years. My wife just got licensed. She's a licensed architect in California. And so we've always talked about working together. But I think it's this kind of, this, this idea of the timeline mm -hmm. and where we are in relationship ship to it. That's really interesting you have that trajectory in mind and I think it's a I think it's something that I, uh, younger designers not necessarily us but younger designers have to think about in the long term to be aware of the the pitfalls of accepting things that are too large or going down this path or that path. Um, and I, and I that makes it makes sense to me. Uh, you were mentioning that your 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 wife is an architect as mm. well. Yes, um, she actually works at Gary Partners. Oh, she's well, been, it looks like architecture caught you at some point, right? We, we met in grad school. She's amazing. She's my best friend. Um, I think she told me specifically, don't talk about me on the podcast. Oh, okay. So, checked. <laughs> um, but yeah, she, she, she's been, her goal was to get licensed before 30. And she, she got licensed when she was 30 and I think two months. Wow. So she, she kind of pretty a, good. It's pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. Um, it took her about a year and a half, which is interesting because um, they're changing now. The kind of they went from uh, 4.0 to 5.0. Yeah. So everything's kind of shifting yeah. um, to get. So now I get to I get to be the next in line to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I guess you would be on the new exams and she took the old one. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which I don't, hopefully the old study material will roll over in some ways. Yeah. There's there's a lot of helpful material and people out there that help you know uh, test takers guide through the process. But the transition has been kind of a mess, I would say. Oh, it's a shit show. Yeah, yeah. yeah Wait a little bit. Once you, are you licensed? Out. He's licensed, and I'm still in the process of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, all your IDPs done. Everything's. Oh, yeah, IDP yeah. has been done. Yeah. AXP. Oh, AXP. Yeah. Excuse me, it's yeah. a new one, right? <laughs> so have you taken any exams? Oh yeah, oh. <laughs> I have two left. Yeah, but they're kind of, they're the new ones, and uh, yeah, I hope I mean, uh, by the time you take them, their study materials would you know be more aligned with actually what's at the exam. Right. I mean, because it's, it's, it's a weird thing. The people who put on the exams don't release the study material. It's all third party stuff, and then when the new exams came, 
all of those third party people overnight had material for the new exam. <laughs> and as it turned out, some of the companies actually just recycled their old stuff and yeah. repackaged it and yeah. sold it as new stuff. Uh, with a lot and of mistakes. They, they kind of got in trouble for it because it was like, you're, you're, you're selling, because a lot of people uh, took the old ones and the new ones. Mm. And then they bought the new material thinking it's going to be different. And they realized that the company was just ripping everyone off. I mean, do you guys think this is ridiculous, this whole examination thing? I mean, other it's, countries... It, it, I think it well, depends coming if, from it, France, I think it's BS. Yeah. Like, really? And talk about the gap between school, between practice, and then the gap between those two and the exams. I mean, this, you know... T t you have people who've been working for 40 years who take those exams and they fail. Yeah. And you have kids who just graduated who take them and they pass. So you can call yourself an architect. The whole, I don't know, the whole title and what you have to do to get the title and how much money all of that costs is just, is a very uh, hot topic <laughs> for me. <laughs> well, I know, like other countries, right, you graduate with a master's degree or something, you can become yeah, like in know, France, an architect, right? Well, in France, for example, you study for five years and then you take basically one year after school when you go to seminars, like twice a week, and then you basically put together like a mock-up firm that you present to a jury you know, with the understanding of, okay, I'm gonna, how I'm going to run the practice, how is the financial side going to work, you know, like a little more concrete stuff. And then you get a license and, and yeah. that's it. Yeah. Here you ha kind of have to be able to wear all the hats and prove that you could be an engineer, a mechanical engineer, an architect, and everybody, which ultimately in the real world it doesn't work that way, yeah. you know. But I think it's a reflection on the kind of policies and, and procedures of the United States, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Like, I think the U.S. is all about business. Yeah. And the legality of that, yeah. and um, you know, there's lots of lawsuits in in architecture. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. And so, uh, one, I mean, it's a kind of professional license. Like you're part of the was it the TCA or something, the kind of um, professional uh, <clears throat> board. Uh, but then on the other hand, there's there's a kind of health and safety risk, right? I mean, we are responsible for yeah. people's lives yeah. if you're building buildings, yeah. and so. Um, I'm okay with the exams. <laughs> you are. Even though, even though, even though I'm not looking forward to taking them, I think part of it is people just put the kind of exams on this pedestal where it's like, oh, this, these are going to be horrible. But in reality, they're not. It's just it's more of it's more of just like putting your head down and doing the work. Yeah. And then checking it off. Hopefully. We'll uh, we we'll talk about it once you start okay. that. Maybe. <laughs> I think the cha the challenge is for a number of uh, practicing architect or soon to be architects is that. If you've been out of school for too long, you forget how to study. Hmm. And if you do read the material, it's quite a bit of material to go through. And, and so that's a, a skill that people lose touch with. But also, it's the fact that it's, it's licensure across, well, it's per state, but it's the same fi of, well, five exams across the entire, entire United States. And that's a really difficult thing to write. So you get language that doesn't make sense to a bunch of people, but mm -hmm. potentially makes sense to others, or makes sense to no one, but therefore is an equal playing field. And it's always written in this, you know, legal, generic kind of SAT verbiage. And so I, I had felt going through it that the exams uh, test your knowledge about architecture and the, and the business and practice and all that stuff, yes, but about 70% of passing exam has more to do with knowing how to take a test yeah. mm -hmm. and looking for those kind of key words in the paragraph that are going to disrupt the answer or lead you to the answer. Right. And I think this is a, it's a specific skill that's not, that has nothing to do with architecture necessarily, and it's one that I think a lot of people have problems with, especially if they've been practicing for a long time. Well, and if you, sorry, and if you compare that to other tests, <clears throat> for other licenses, right? Like you take the bar exam, you take you know, you're a doctor or physical therapist, you take exams. Mm -hmm. It's really focused on the knowledge. You know exactly what you're going to be tested on and how you're going to be tested on. Yeah. And the architecture one, I feel like you can read, I've read all the books and I failed multiple times the same exam because. Well, I think I think yeah. part of that is because they're they're expecting you to be practicing. Mm. Like they're expecting people who are taking these exams are already in an office and that some of the things that are not in the study material you should be getting from from your experience. Mm -hmm. At least that's my understanding of it. Is it's it, intentional. It, it's, I think it's definitely, I mean, I've heard both. People say that you should practice for a bit. People say don't, just take it when you're a student because you're yeah. in that study mode. I think having practice helps for sure. But there's at some point, if you rely too much on that knowledge, you will fail because mm -hmm. the language and the way they want you to do things is different from how most practicing architects do it. Because most practicing architects maybe are very are from a very specific region, or they do things incorrectly, or whatever it yeah. might be. But there's a big gap 
uh, there's a big dis difference between, again, uh, a question, the question and answer that would happen in real life for most practitioners versus what it is on the tests. And this makes a lot of people very confused. Yeah. And it, I guess it depends on what you want to do with your life, right? Mm. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I personally don't think uh, buildings have, um, if I say they don't have anything to do with architecture, that seems a little bit simple minded. But uh, I think they're one output of a larger conversation in relationship to theory or uh, drawings or, or um, uh, group events or other things, you know, people talking like this podcast is just as important for me, I think, that it is a building in architecture. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it just depends if you really want to, if, if you enjoy working on buildings <clears throat> and everything that, that goes in with that. Um, then yes, you should go for it. The other thing is like you legally can't call yourself an architect in the United States until you're licensed. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's another maybe egotistical thing is like we want to be able to call ourselves an architect. A lot of people take tests. Yeah, yeah. For that. In private, in the mirror, I'm an architect. <laughs> but I, I still think it's a small group of people who are working on architecture, and and maybe to those people it, it really doesn't matter if you're a licensed architect. I think what matters is the kind of work you're producing, and sometimes it's, um, you know, cartoons or videos or software. Software, and then sometimes it's a building, yeah. right? Even though I think the ultimate aim would be a completed building. I think Walter Gropius once said that, um, and I completely agree with it. That's still the kind of aim yeah. of, of what we're doing. But yeah, it's a challenge right now with, with licensure. Yeah, and, and the profession on that side has become much more complicated because of technology and the way the industries are becoming much more specific, that it's it's difficult. And I and I would agree. I don't think it's, it's a good idea to... to have a lower opinion of, I guess the, the word would be a designer who does architecture uh, just because they're not licensed. I mean, that's, that's definitely not the case. Uh, and there's plenty of people we know who are super talented, but they're just not licensed. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, so what? <clears throat> that said, so in the few, in your in your fifty year plan that you have marked out, do you think you and your wife would ever? I know we're not supposed to talk about it. Sophie, <laughs> Sophie, 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 my partner, yeah, right. Sophie. Would you, would you guys ever team up and and have do your own thing together or work together? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> um, it's it's funny. So when we started dating in, in at Sire, we kind of made it a secret. At least we tried to. So we didn't tell anyone we were dating for a whole year. Why? Just because in architecture school there's no privacy, like it, I think it, like other uh, compared to other disciplines or other subjects, where you're there for class and you go home, you know go back to your house, your dorm, whatever. And you, like architecture school, you're always around people. It becomes almost like a second family, and I, I think um, one we didn't want to lose the autonomy of the individual. Like we wanted to be seen as individuals and not as a kind of couple, mm -hmm. but two also just making it something that's not so public in the school itself. I mean, like when everyone knows someone is dating. So for the for one full year, we didn't tell anyone. And it was funny because the second semester we got grouped up as studio partners. And so we had a trial run of working on a project together. Oh, God. And now if you ask her, she, she would say it was terrible. For me, it was fantastic. Um, and so we have worked together before, I think, um, in that context, but also in some other things. And um, we both went to Sire. We both worked at Gary Partners. Um, we've both been exposed to, I think, uh, a very specific type of education and way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so maybe because of that, we'd be a really good match to work on problems together. But um, I, don't, I don't know. I'd How be okay if we didn't, but yeah. I would love to. Right. How did you hide to everyone for a year that you were dating? I mean, that's So, like so we'd really have it planned. So I would leave, like, or she would leave out the front door. And then, <laughs> like, and then exactly like eight minutes later, I would leave out the back door. Right? So there'd be a kind of like... Someone in the studio was like, "Okay, those two are always leaving eight minutes apart every day. What's what? What is this?" I think I think some of our closer friends knew. But, right. Um, there's just no privacy in architecture school. Yeah. It's funny you say that because um, thinking back to yeah, in, in school it's so tight, and when people hook well, hook up as a baby too loose of a uh, inappropriate of a term, but you know, get together the date or whatever it is, everyone knows, and it's like. Okay, those two have been together. Now he's going to go with her, and everyone keeps track of these things. And it, it changes, right or wrong, it kind of changes your perception of, but, of these people. But that's architecture for me—the kind of politics and gossip <laughs> and like the inner relation, working of relationships. Like for me, that's the closest you can get to architecture is is, is that dynamic. I'm serious. I think I think like looking at academics and looking at practicing architects and the kind of network that takes place. Um, there's something extremely architectural about the kind of gossip mm. and the kind of um, 
the the kind of gazing from afar mm -hmm. at people and trying to kind of project things. I guess that 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 could be uh, projected onto any type of discipline. But it's very funny in architecture. There's lots of gossip. There's lots of talking. There's lots of like meandering and looking and <laughs> and I I don't know. I think I think it's really kind of relevant to talk about. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've always now. I've always thought that designing an architecture school would be a lot of fun. One because in a way you're the client, uh, but also because we have such an in-depth knowledge of it, and it is a fascinating place. Assuming the students are going to be there roughly 24-7, like that's a pretty rare thing to design for. And the kinds of, and I think if you are a dedicated student and you're there very often and you're aware of your physical environment and how people interact, I mean, that in itself is an education to see the nuances between people. And, and it's a, it, I, I'd agree, it's a very fascinating thing. I mean, I'm very interested in people and groups and how they operate anyway. Mm -hmm. and to see how people click or don't click and where they go and how they talk to others is, it's, um, I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't be part of, of, of what defines architecture, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. It's one of those questions that can't be defined. <laughs> So you uh, were at SciArc for your master's, right? That's correct, yeah. Instead of th two or three? Two, two and a half years, mm. five semester. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Life-changing experience? Amazing. I can't say enough positive things about that school. It's an interesting place. I've only been inside the building a couple of times as a, uh, not even a guest, as a person who just kind of walked, <laughs> walked through the door uh, when it happened to be open. It's a very, I imagine that, that on this conversation that working in that one building would be very, very unique, right? <clears throat> it's one way of putting it. Because <laughs> uh, it's one building, and there's the one giant, or yeah, two I mean, hallways. I think this is the kind of circulated um, definition of the school itself as a kind of um, building typology in relationship to an architectural school. It's essentially one giant hallway. It's like one giant pinup wall. And so because of that, everyone gets to see what everyone else is working on. And that in itself kind of fuels the fire mm. for like more and more and more production. So I mean, even like at other schools, like there's classrooms you can pin up in. And so unless you know the exact time, mm -hmm. you kind of have to. So SciArc, you always know what everything is like simultaneously what's happening within a very specific moment within the school. And it goes from first year undergrad all the way up to, um, you know, even the art entertainment, the EDGE program, the MR program. Um, but I think go, coming from my undergrad, which is a very traditional um, way of looking, you know, um, we studied a lot of Samuel Maccabee, Rural Studio, uh, the poetics of space, you know, what, how do you use a two by four, precast concrete, you know, things that are, I think, are very specific to the Southeast. Hmm. Um, and then coming to SciArc and being exposed not only to a completely different lexicon in a way of working, but also to a history of architecture that's been around for quite some time that I don't think people are fully aware of. Uh, history mean specific to the specific to the school? Uh, even beyond the school, like uh, the people who helped start the school, mm -hmm. I think the LA architecture scene <clears throat> um, and how that's how that's uh, helped influence that school, SciArc in particular. Um, but I was I was there when Eric Moss was still director. I think Hernan took over maybe <coughs> eight, two years after I left or something. Mm. Um, and so Hernan was the uh, grad director or in charge of thesis. Mm -hmm. And I think thesis um, was very important at SciArc. That's what's interesting about the school is that when you start, you start in September. And so in graduation at SciArc is in September. So you get to see all the final students work when you first come in, and so it's a kind of Kickstarter mm -hmm. too. So that experience alone kind of changed my understanding of architecture. And so how does that, that work? So the academic year is split into like three semesters, or the last semester bleeds it's over? It's still it's still two semesters in a summer. Um, it's just like <coughs> fifth year students have to wait until September to for graduation. Even though they, um, get their, they get their diploma, I think, in May or April or whenever it is, um, the graduation happens in, in September. And are, are they working through the summer? Uh, well, for thesis is over the summer. Okay. Um, and then there's other classes that happen. Just making That's interesting. Interest. But um, but yeah, I appreciate my education there. It was um, it was very beneficial for me, in particular. I think one of the reasons why I went to SARC is because I was so interested in film. Hmm. And I think looking at other schools, it, it was like uh, SARC was like, oh, I could do this. I could use film as a kind of medium or something um, for the work and not be judged or criticized for it. <laughs> yeah. Because um, yeah. I think in my, my undergrad, I got some pushback for that. Really? 
Um, I think it just dep it depends on on you know the way you use the tool. But um, where did you go for your undergrad? Uh, in Charlotte, University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Okay. Um, it's an amazing program, amazing group of people. Um, I was there when they were rewriting their first year. We were actually part of the class who were rewriting their first year uh, design studio for undergrad. Um, it was absolutely amazing. Um, and even to this day, I index things from that specific class. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm grateful for, for both the schools. Like, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that, and also the relationships that I made and the, the friendships. Um, but just the kind of polar opposite, like uh, really traditional architecture and also contemporary art, and then kind of radical, really unfamiliar, uh, both language but also form and ways of working, mm -hmm. and then how those two kind of came together. Um, that's, yeah, that's where I'm staying. So. Yeah, I think that's really exciting. And I think, uh, I think having the opportunity and the will to, to go explore different things, um, even if perhaps you disagree with them at first, I don't, I'm not talking about you specifically, um, is a great way to operate. And especially with our profession, which is, finds itself difficult to define at times, that it's a great way to operate. And it, do you think you're going to go back to school? Again, looking down. Well, like the, the life something? plan is pretty busy already. <laughs> another degree, another de yeah, another <laughs> master's, <laughs> another a, a PhD, or I don't know, or something. It's a question that I always ask myself. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I uh, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to talk to Sophie about that. <laughs> that is the correct answer, I believe. Um, if it was up for, if money wasn't an obstacle, if time wasn't an obstacle, if. A whole bunch of contingencies were an obstacle. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. I would. I would love to stay in school for as long as I can. But um, in some ways, my job is staying in school. Like, and it's 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 a different type of um, <coughs> education in the sense that you're not paying someone to teach you, and it kind of you're teaching yourself but teaching other people. And so it's in some ways it's kind of a a, a different way of looking at that that question. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I I would consider myself more of a designer than an academic. I think in some ways. So I don't know if like a PhD or going to get another degree would make sense for me right, right. now. Yeah. Um, so probably no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, for me, for myself, I really, really enjoyed being, it's a love-hate, because when you're in it, sometimes you want to you know, kill yourself. But uh, I really loved being in school because it's such a, it's, it's a breeding ground for new ideas and you, get, you just get to focus on what you were interested in, you know, and be super passionate about and just go down that, Direction and be surrounded by really brilliant people, and it's it's like where else do you get this opportunity? Again, there's many other factors that come into play. You mentioned like it costs a lot of money and et cetera, et cetera. But to have to be in that space is is so much for me at least so much fun. And it actually perplexes me when people are like, no, I'd never ever go back to school, not because of practical factors, um, but just because they they hated it. I'm like, you hate. You hate learning, like this is the, you, you're absorbing, you yeah. know, so much information. I think, and that just depends on your personality. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think some of those fascinating conversations I've ever had are in the hallways at school, like in the bathroom, in the break room, um, like behind the closed door of the public. And I think yeah. the institution being the kind of <clears throat> melting pot for new ideas. Um, that's why I get up in the morning. It's very motivating yeah. to to try and um, contribute to that conversation, and that's why I love school in, in general. Yeah. Um, but I have heard a lot of people being like, you couldn't pay me enough money to go back to school or you couldn't, <laughs> you know, and they just, they hated it. And that's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, maybe they had a bad teacher. I don't know. Um, but, uh, there's something m motivating and productive about knowledge. Yeah. And I, the, the, the few people that we've spoken with who have their own practice and are doing quite well, they also, Actually, a lot of people who are successful and in various ways, they perceive what they do as an education. Your description of teaching is, is kind of like that, right? Um, and one of the people we had on, who was actually a graduate from this school, says that he views his practice, he doesn't teach, he just does practices, but he views his practice as an education. And he has enough money coming in, so he will task people with, okay, let's do some in-depth research about steel or about this particular detail, and we'll spend a few days or a week on it or whatever. I'm like that's a really great way of looking at it, you know, because you have like your employees or your students slash your faculty slash your uh, your peers at the same time, and that's a and and in, in that sense, like it's a really exciting thing to be practicing if you think of it that way. Yeah, 
I think the benefit though of not having in the office is like being able to pay for people's paycheck every month and like put food <laughs> on the table. There's a lot of anxiety I think in in running your own office, mm. um, which is is different than like putting your head down in the library or in a studio space in your office, just working on a problem, mm. right? With with no type of factors. Um, I don't know. Do you are you guys? Do you guys want to have your own firm one day? Is that something you've talked oh, about? Oh, that's why we moved out here. <laughs> yeah, we're in the process of it. We're in the process. We're in the process of, of it. Yeah. Uh, between that and like the fifty other things, I feel like we're doing. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so you know, we were in New York practicing for and working for a number of different places, and and I think in the back of our minds, the idea of having our own firm was something we liked. It's it's. When we decide, decided to move out here and start the practice, a big question uh, was, when do we do that? Because we've seen people who do it too soon, it seemed like, and they start the practice, and let's say they have some really good success in the beginning, but they clearly don't have the knowledge and need to sustain that practice or to get to the next level of doing buildings, right? Mm -hmm. And we've also seen people kind of wait too long, and they aren't able to it has more to do with the, with the personality, I think, at that point. They aren't able to, to find their own identity mm -hmm. because they're too stuck with what they've done before. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's not black or white, and it's different for every person, but this was one of the things we considered when we moved out here. I just think it's really hard to convince people that give you a lot of money, That's <laughs> especially at our trick. age. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> really, even I know people who are in their 40s who struggle with, I mean, buildings are expensive, right? I mean, I can understand doing an interior or something small scale. It's, it's fine. But... Uh, when you're talking about twenty five hundred seven hundred fifty million dollars for a building, um, there's something very serious about that. Unless you have gray hair, uh, Which they're you're, not, coming, you're, they're you're not serious. You're not serious <laughs> yeah. enough. Um, and that's I think that's one of the reasons why I'm more interested in working on a kind of body of work and also research and how I work mm -hmm. than I am the kind of building. Right. Right. Um, even though there's nothing more satisfying than like producing a set of drawings and handing it over to someone, and then you know a year or two <coughs> years later you go to the site and there it is, um, it's it's kind of a high. Um, but but yeah, I think we could sit here and like plan out our futures, but you have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. All you know, all you can control is to like do your work. That's it. And whether that's like marketing yourself or. Um, uh, producing work, 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 even if you don't share it, or like knowing how to solve a problem when a, when a problem gets presented to you. Um, uh, that's the key, I think, is like being ready to bounce on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm super optimistic about architecture right now. I think it's an amazing time to be an architect and to be part of this. So I, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the, well, why, why would you say that? But and, and, and as an extension from that, uh, what are these? What are some of the current trends or future trends or things you see in the profession, um, either in academia or in the profession or whatever, in architecture in general, that that are highly motivating to you? Yeah, I think there's there's two things, um, at, least in, at least in academia, <coughs> are happening right now within the discipline. One is um, uh, machine vision, technology, uh, games, the kind of using the digital beyond what we've known it to be, even like you know really pushing the boundaries of automation, um, things like that. Mm. Uh, another thing I've, I've really noticed is uh, this relationship to scale. Uh, so things that are built to like one-to-one -one or larger than, you know, just a kind of physical model you can put on your desk. I think a lot of people are really interested in building, um, uh, not necessarily wanting to build a building, but like interested in full resolution studies or um, try to understand more details, things that, um, you have you can only work through and understand if you build the thing. Right. Um, at least I noticed that in art too, like large scale things, hmm. especially in graphic design, people have been doing some really large scale, like posters and prints that are the size of buildings sometimes. Um, uh, so those are like two things on my radar that I'm noticing. Another thing, there's been a discussion about nostalgia. So looking back in the past 20 years to figure out how we move forward, I think there's been so much noise happening. Um, that we're trying to figure out where it's all leading. And so one way of doing that is revisiting the things we produced <coughs> 5, 10, 20 years ago hmm. in hopes that we can kind of uh, refocus what we're doing. Uh, because if you're getting constantly bombarded with all these things, you can't you can't keep working on your project. Right. And so I think looking back at your body of work and understanding where you are um, 
is also another thing I'm seeing as well. But this is this is just coming from me. I'm sure there's other there's other tangents happening right now within the discourse, especially I have no idea what's happening on the East Coast. Um, uh, so those are the two things or three things that I think are happening right now. Yeah, I think the re the reflecting period is you know, kind of you described at the end is is interesting and actually. Unless I'm misremembering or misinterpreting what he said, uh, when we had David Basulto on here, uh, the co-founded Arc Daily, he was saying that I had I had asked him a similar question, and um, he he felt like that our generation or now or the near future will need a new Kenneth Frampton to whether that's one Kenneth Frampton or a group of people or whatever, to kind of look at everything that's happened more recently and then ref and frame it in some way so we have an understanding and a clarity of what's gone on. Not, not to, to position it and to skew it, but to, to give it more form. Um, otherwise, as you said, it's, it is chaos. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and I, don't know, I mean, now the chaos comes, comes uh, opportunity. I think that was a quote from Game of Thrones. <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> watching a lot of Game of Thrones, um, but but also, it, it, or it could just be a mess. And I think um, the next five to ten years for the profession are going to is going to be really, really interesting. Really interesting. Yeah, we always think we're in, in crisis, right? Architects always think they're in crisis mode, and mm -hmm. that's for every generation. We're not, <laughs> but we use that as a kind of product. Anxiety is a kind of productive right, tool yeah, right. to get work done. We're like, oh, it's all over. It's, <laughs> over. it's not over. It's never going to be over. Um, it's it's never been over, right? right? There's been obstacles that we have to overcome, both as a discipline, but also publicly. Um, but yeah, I, I like these conversations about like, oh, what's next? What's happening? What's and and maybe maybe um, it's not our job. Maybe the the theorist or the historian will come along and try and define it for us. Um, like, what does it mean for for people to work on a podcast in architecture? Right, it's very uncharted territory, mm. and and what does that do from a historical standpoint? Um, and the fact that you can kind of index it, I was kind of scared coming on here because I've been hearing horror stories about new technologies. I was listening to Radio Lab, and they were saying there's this new software where if you say enough, the exact words, you can like reconstruct people's oh yeah Sentences. voice yeah. into a sentence. And then there's the kind of uh, the kind of face mapping thing as well, <laughs> right? So if, if you do enough online things, like yeah. eventually someone can control you in a kind of digital future. I've heard about this. They they did a sample with uh, Barack Obama, and yeah. when you hear it, it sounds totally convincing. Even if you you know it's fake, and you listen, you you're tuned in. Like okay, I'm gonna. If I'm gonna, the, between the words, there's going to be some weird pause, but it sounds completely legit. But that was the first one. That was, that was like the, the first, first edition. And now they're they're getting advanced. way better. You know, um, but it's interesting because I think it's I think that's part of of architecture, the discipline, whatever it is, is always trying new things, right? I mean, sometimes there's tools that suggest a problem, mm. right? And then sometimes there's a problem that suggests you have to kind of um, uh, fix it by a specific tool, um, and so maybe like you're creating your own problem um, in a kind of productive way, right? Um, so it's exciting. So, th so like those types of, of, of subjects that are happening, they're very uncharted happening right now, yeah. um, is another thing I think that's current within within architecture as a kind of collective. I wanted to ask you about your f kind of film background. Um, when did that come to the forefront for you? Was it something you were always interested in? I, I, so in art school, I, I made my first, I made a, f a stop motion like video or something. I can't remember what it was. I think it was on like an object. And so I said typography was an object. So I did this like motion graphic thing on typography being an object or something. Um, so that was my first film ever. Um, uh, it was a kind of animation thing, the kind of real footage f film. So at the time, this is when Vimeo had just started. Mm -hmm. And it's when uh, the DSLR <laughs> camera could record film. Mm -hmm. So this was happening like um, 2006, 2007, 2008, around this time. And so I ended up purchasing a camera for Rome to shoot photographs, like to take photographs, and ended up just filming. And I, I don't know what it was, but like composition and frame and movement and editing is something I just kind of stumbled upon. I was never trained on it. And then um, when I went to SciArc, I produced a film just for the love of it. I just kind of showed up and started filming the kind of graduate thesis uh, weekend 
like the kind of production of the graduate thesis weekend. I saw it. It's a good film. Oh, thanks. It's it's it, 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 it's very exciting to watch. It is exciting, and uh, it was fun to work on. But it got like I think it got over one hundred fifty thousand views, uh -huh. and I didn't realize the kind of politics of that. But it opened a lot of doors for me. It's it's Cyrac. I got to meet a lot of people and had more opportunities, and it was just it was always just a kind of break for me. Like mm. a break from the computer, a break from model making is I could just grab my camera and go film things and kind of document things. Um, and in some ways, I see that very much part of my kind of architectural project, mm. the kind of information that's around us and how we start to document it um, uh, and collect things. Um, and then so that, that one film led me to... Uh, my next film, which was at Cyarc. So usually over the summer at Cyarc, you do a kind of internship, usually with one of the faculty or outside the school. And the school had already kind of decided that they wanted me to produce a film with them <laughs> for this thing. Um, it was called Advances in Architecture Geometry, which was shown at the Pompidou Center at Paris. Our friend, no it was, it's amazing. No, it's an amazing <laughs> opportunity. Um, and I got to work with uh, Hervik Baumgartner, who directed it. Amazing guy, B plus you, Scott Erie. Um, I just basically was in his office for the whole summer making this film. Um, so that was the kind of second film. Um, and I kept working on films. And then after graduating, I ended up working on more films, uh, just as a kind of, also as a way of means, but also just more opportunities. I ended up producing these films for the Grounded Visionaries campaign at Harvard, mm -hmm. um, a couple of them. Um, this was back in 2014, 2015. Um, and then the most recent thing is I'm working on a documentary for an artist named Simon Birch, who created this thing called the 14th Factory. And so for, that, for about 96 days, I followed this artist around in L.A. and also in Hong Kong um, uh, about his show, he, this kind of pop-up he did. So there's always like these film, simultaneously these film projects that are happening in my life in relationship to the architecture. I don't know what that means. I don't know where it's going. I think at some point I'd love to produce a, a, a film about LA architecture, mm. um, and I think that would be a, a kind of a, one project, in and also relationship to like a building, yeah. and other things. Um, but yeah, film is fun. <laughs> film is really fun. So when you're doing like this documentary, um, how technically is that done? Do you just bring your DSLR, or is there a whole crew? Or no, I was using a, a Sony, a, a, a mirrorless camera. So Ooh. it was like a 4K shoot slow motion. It's like a more of a, the DSLR is a little bit lower res. I think the 5D five, five is okay, but. Yeah, and they're limited to how long they can shoot before they shut down. Yeah, so the Sony was better. So we had some better gear and had a shoulder rig and things like that. Um, wow. Yeah, and I would just, and like that's the art, that was the artist in me, is like you get up in the morning and you, you're kind of a fly on the wall and you just follow someone, mm -hmm. right? And the kind of seriousness of doing that every single day and trying to record a kind of story. Um, documentaries are a lot of work. <laughs> I think in total, it's like we have eight terabytes of footage. Oh, my God. Um, it's 4K? 4K. That's, I mean, the, the, the computing power alone must be insane to, yeah. to handle that much information. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, uh, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it means at all. <laughs> um, I just, just do it. I just do it. You don't have just, to know. What you it just means. do things. I don't yeah, know. You just yeah, do yeah. things because you love to do them, and, yeah. and that's what that's what film has been for me. It's just a kind of, I just do that. I don't know why, um, but I haven't I haven't been re working on anything other than that. So is that one set to debut? Is there is there a no, deadline for that? No, it's it's not. We worked on it for a while. Um, he's trying to open his next uh, his next show. Hopefully, it was supposed to open in London. I'm not sure what's opening next. But I think there's also some legality questions we have to deal with. Um, it's a super interesting story. So the entire documentary is is based off of a fake documentary. So uh, when he came to Los Angeles, um, he spent a year or six months putting in the show. I think it cost two, three thousand, two, two or three million dollars. It was a huge art thing. It's, it's amazing. Um, plain tells and uh, screens and all this stuff. Huge production. Uh, a month before it was supposed to open, there was that ghost fire up in San Francisco. <clears throat> Do you guys remember that? Yeah. That uh, DIY space that caught on fire and, oh, yeah, and burnt. Yeah. And so Los Angeles County basically put a stop to all art exhibitions that weren't inside uh, spaces that were coded for art, that were like built for art, ex like gallery spaces. And so he found this old abandoned warehouse that he put his and so they, they completely shut down the thing they were like you're wow. we're not we're not letting you open it he's three million dollars in debt um 
the show's supposed to open in a month, what does he do kind of thing. So they basically fabricated a fake documentary um, and basically put together a little document that said, if you come to the, the exhibition, you have to sign this little waiver, and you're basically a, a extra on a film set. Interesting, as a way to get around the issues. As a way to get around it. And like when I showed up and met him, no one was filming it. They had a camera like in the <laughs> office just in case some, like the fire marshal or someone showed up. Like, oh yeah, we're filming. But it was purely a tool to uh, to open the exhibition, and so and so for me, I'm like, okay, I want to do a documentary on the fake documentary and the project, and so that's really what it's about. Interesting um, for me, um, even though for him, I think he's been working on this for ten years. Um, there's been tons of work he's been producing in Hong Kong and London and everywhere else. But it's a really fascinating story. <laughs> a lot of weird things that happened. So did he get his three million dollars back? They, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they did really. They broke even, I think, or they did. They did pretty well. That's wow. a very um, smart idea. A lot of patrons, and they had tons of people. There was a really big incident with this um, selfie domino accident, where this woman who took a selfie, she actually hit one of the pedestals, <gasps> and they, they domino effect. Oh no! And it like it was trending the top video on the BBC. <laughs> You know? So it was interesting seeing going viral too. Right. I think in an age where there's there's so much media, um, he's an amazing guy. Simon Birch is amazing, um, and I was grateful to be there to document it. Um, but that's I guess that's something different than the architectural endeavors that I'm working on. No, yeah, but it's such as interesting. I mean, um, we look forward to to whatever gets is completed. We'll see it on Vimeo, Vimeo or something else. I don't know. We'll see what what right. happens. Right. Um, yeah, it's an immense amount of work. I mean, this is not a, we shouldn't even compare the two, but we have these two cameras, <laughs> and to, this is how. So that one we bought for 150 bucks used. This one is my dad's old camera from 2008. <laughs> <laughs> so people are like, your video quality sucks. I'm like, yeah, I know it sucks. Does the HD stand for 720? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. At best, yeah. That one actually might be 1080. Okay. Oh, it does. Um, 920 by 1080. I see. Yeah. It has, yeah. It has AF for autofocus. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and if you move too much, everything goes blurry. <laughs> it's just really, really terrible. Um, oh. But yeah, the amount of work that that video, even like some simple, just fixed frame stuff, takes to, to deal with. But there's a funny there's a funny relationship between film and, and architecture. I mean, like both are uh, collaborative. Like, let's say the production of a building versus the production of a film. Um, it takes a huge amount of people. There's huge budgets. Like the cost of a movie is the same cost as a as a, as a building yeah. in some cases. Um, and and there's a kind of strange relationship. Even the kind of props or sets or things that are happening. Um, but they're still very very much different. I don't know a lot of people who are working on film and architecture. Um, I know the Spirit of Space guys should do some amazing work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know of them. Uh, fil a film in architecture as an architects making films or I films about architecture? I don't know. Yeah, it just mm -hmm. as a kind of its own little niche within our, our discourse. Mm -hmm. um, it's still very up for grabs, I think, at this point. Yeah, that's, prob that's probably true, actually. And I think film is something we all recognize as being very, fairly parallel to, to architecture and what we do. I and mean, this has been around for a long time. But yeah, no one's really seized it. And you think it would have happened maybe by now since the accessibility is there, more or less with iPhones. And well, maybe it, maybe the architecture has nothing to do with film. Maybe that's the, <laughs> the secret. So it never will be. Right? Well, you go through it and then let us know <laughs> what you find. I don't find. know. So, yeah. so how long does it take you to edit one of those films? Uh, so the, the first one, the Cyrk one, the weekend one, I did it in four hours. <laughs> you did it in wow. four hours? I did it, like, I think on Sunday is when the, the show, the... Um, Sunday was graduation, and I think I, I went home at like 10 o'clock at night, and I finished it at like 2 in the morning, and Jesus. I sent it to them on Monday. <laughs> so it was like very, so there was no planning. It was almost like a stream of consciousness. You just mm -hmm. kind of start putting stuff together. Um, other films were like the Harvard Visionaries ones. That took me four months. Wow. <laughs> like every day, six days a week for, I don't know, 10 hours a day. Wow. And really part of it has to do with going through all the interviews and all the B-roll and all the footage and making notes and also making sure you convert file formats and making sure you label things correctly. <laughs> um, that's a different type of process. Yeah. So it just depends. Like if you're an artist creating video, it's very quick. If you're a professional filmmaker, yeah. it's a lot of work. The, the weird thing that we found, that I found with audio and video, is that y you... 
if I'm going to preview the, the, an interview that's a couple hours, I have to listen to it for two hours. I can listen to it at twice speed, but I can't really do that because I don't miss things potentially. And it dawned on me like this, it takes so much time because it's not like architecture where I can look at a plan. Even if I've been doing this plan for the last six months, I can give it a once over in two minutes, I'll feel good you know, before I'm gonna submit it or whatever. But with film or video, mm -hmm. I, there's no glancing, really. It's like, okay, if I'm gonna make sure it's all good, it's gonna take however long that process is. I think they say for like one one minute of edited footage is like two hours of, or what is it, one, one minute of completed footage, like a completed film, is like two hours of editing or four, three hours yeah. of editing. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but hopefully technology advances, right? Like the, the thing about audio recordings is you can't really see. I guess you can transcribe it digitally, right? That's yeah, the thing. Yeah, and they have some digital um, automated ones that are pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good, yeah. But you don't want to miss anything. That's the, that's the, the bad <laughs> that's thing. The part, it's yeah. like, oh, I don't want to miss something. So you have to sit there. So like right now, you guys are going to have to go back and listen to this whole thing. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, or let's do it a couple times, right? And then you take notes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a different thing. It's it's like I don't know. It for me, maybe because I'm the one who does it. Like being able to scan over a a, a graphic board with different plans and stuff, I can do that's easy. Because there's a there's a kind of a, a mindset or a lens you put on to see to to look at everything quickly, but still see the details. But you're not allowed to do that if it's a, a time based kind of uh, yeah. a format. Um, have you seen the Avengers movie yet? Because yes, the last time we talked to you didn't see it, and I was shocked uh, and also amazed that you, you didn't know anything that happened, that you stayed off of social media. So I've been, I've, been, I've been extremely busy for the past two weeks, um, just finishing up school, and also we just installed the Currents exhibition, uh, which took a lot of time, and so I haven't had on my calendar like a, a four-hour block. <laughs> like I literally has, have Half not had... Half a day. <laughs> I, either I'm in meetings or I'm working on something else, and, and so... Um, Unfortunately, I I did get uh, I had a spoiler moment, <gasps> and I and it was ended up being the climax of the film. What was the spoiler moment? Oh, what if our audience hasn't listened? Oh, to no, we'll, we'll, I'll, listen I'll, to I'll let them know in, in the intro yeah. that. Uh... So I watched the new Spider-Man trailer. Oh, yeah. And I and I before I before it was there was no audio, and so I clicked on it too late when they said, "Hey, there's spoilers." Yeah, you missed the and first. And so I immediately stopped it, and I was like, "Oh, that can't be that bad, <laughs> right? That can't be that can't be horrible." And then, and I'm going to the film, and I'm like, "Okay, I know this is going to happen." <laughs> right. um, so, other than that, it was absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, really, uh, I love those movies. Uh, Sophie doesn't like them very much, so I have to go by myself. <laughs> what? You <laughs> go by yourself, or with friends sometimes? Okay. <laughs> like I, or, um, like that in Star Wars is kind of a tough. It took me a while to appreciate both of those films, but you just have to keep dragging her to them and eventually she would start liking them. <laughs> so she's saying this based on her experience. Not a huge fan. Although you like Iron Man. No. Well, he's dead now, so no. it doesn't matter. Oh, don't ruin it. She has some more respect <laughs> for the fallen. Uh, he's going to be back. I mean, no, he's not going to be back. That's, that's the point yeah. of the, the, the... Time time travel. He, yeah, time travel, <laughs> you know. Yeah, the, the the Marvel. I'm assuming you've seen all the past ones, pretty much, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, with the Infinity War, and this last one, I think I took took a, a an iPhone photo of the end credits when they say digital artists, and it's like ten minutes of just a screen of names. It's <laughs> insane. I don't know how they it gets orchestrated. It it, it blows my mind because I mean we're talking about architecture and parallels. Yeah, like in yeah. architecture, you're doing a big master plan with a bunch of buildings. Like that's crazy. But with this project or something like the Avengers and all the digital artists, yeah. it's just. Well, if I had to relate it to architecture, it's a little bit like X refs, right? Like everyone's working <laughs> on it. Everyone's working on a sheet, <laughs> and then like the finished product is like 15 sheets collapsed. Right. And so, um, like there's one person who's just like working on on like fog right yeah. and like their job is to like make the fog look as wonderful oh, yes, and, it, and then it gets just kind of x reft in right. right to the kind of master rendering thing but it is it is pretty amazing um where we are today with technology in relationship to uh film um and how realistic and convincing it can be when it's all just green screen, and these people aren't even where they're wearing. He's wearing half an Iron, half an Iron Man uh, costume, right? And the gray <laughs> spandex, and like 
that's it in green screens. It's 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 really really bizarre that they're able to go from that and technically have it be hyper real, but yeah. also that they're able to maintain emotion and story and everything else between that gap of basically nothing to the final product. Yeah, and I think we we're fortunate in the process that we go through in that you more or less have an idea what the final thing is going to be because we produce. I mean, I guess they do too. They produce renderings, but we, we have a better sense. There's not that, that much of a gap, at least from the public's eye. Right? I don't know. I feel like films are more specific than architects mm. and architecture, or excuse me, more specific than buildings. Even though um, a building is real and like you have to order a part and it shows up, there's so many RFIs um, and like exchanging of information to the point where it, it goes by so quickly that you really can't think about things. Mm. So sometimes, sometimes you show up to a building and you're like, oh, I did put that in the drawing. Right. Right. It's kind of a surprise where like <laughs> films are, are kind of diagram and organized down to the second. Right. Um, but they're very different, both, to, both of those disciplines in some ways. Do you think that if you weren't uh, dedicating your life or it's so much in architecture that you would try in an alternate life to do film? I don't, as a full time thing? I don't know. I think I, I'm just I just care about architecture. I don't know. I love architecture. It wasn't in the dream. It wasn't in the dream. Right. That's right. The premonition. Yeah, Unless focused? it's the building of a film company. Right. <laughs> um, sure. I mean, I think it's funny to think about parallel lives or like alternative lives. Like, what are you good at? Um, I think as humans, our brain we can we can learn just about anything over time, and for some reason, whether it's fate or just me doing it, I'm in architecture. Um, even though sometimes I use other mediums or disciplines like film uh, as part of my work. But I, I remember I did this um, Architect Magazine interview, uh, the Millennials hmm. edition. Um, uh, this happened in 2013. Um, and they interviewed a bunch of like millennials who were like, well, what do you want to do in 10 years? <laughs> and I think I told them I would love to be the director of um, architecture films. And so someone that I was looking at is uh, Joseph Kaczynski, who went to Columbia, who like his first, I mean, he did some commercials and stuff, but one of his first films was Tron. Yeah, Tron like, uh, Legacy. Legacy, yeah. right? Which is amazing to think that, you know, you can go to architecture school and then you can <laughs> go and, and what's, what's interesting about uh, Kaczynski is like he uses... Um, very specific um, technology, but also like spatial um, tools and techniques for filming. So like the Oblivion one, like he ended up scanning all of the mountains in the Andes or something, and then like producing a set with the actual colors from the scan into the production, like the, the site itself. Um, so for, for me, like a long time ago, I was really interested in, in producing, but I feel, I feel like I have I feel like with the Ground Divisionaries campaign and like some of the other films that I produce, I feel like, okay, I can check that off. Right, right. And now what's the next chapter? Mm -hmm. And so right now, I guess it's about that design education mm -hmm. and understanding how you, how you, for me, how to understand that, but also just like helping Heather with whatever she needs and helping Woodbury and, and trying to create change in a kind of productive and positive way, or just like, I guess, leading the next chapter of Woodbury or helping lead the next chapter of Woodbury with her and Ingelil, and Ewan, uh, and Christoph. Oh, there's a whole bunch of people who are just amazing um, academics and leaders at the school, and I'm really grateful to be a part of it. Um, uh, but with that said, like right now, it's just about architecture. Yeah. You know, um, even though film, there's a lot more money. <laughs> right. There's there's like a kind of you know more, you can reach more people easily. Yeah. Architecture is not so much. That's an interesting. Uh... I said, yeah, it's an interesting observation. It's one that I th we're hoping the podcast can kind of address in some way, even though it's not a building. Um, but I think that's a beautiful note to end it on. That was, that was a <laughs> very nice speech. I liked it. That was good. I think we're ready to take <laughs> on the rest of the day, right? Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's great. Thanks. Cheers. Well, well, well. Thank you, all of you out there, for listening to this episode with well, Ryan. Well, well. <laughs> Thanks to our guest, Ryan, for joining us today. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a lot of fun chit-chatting with him about all of those different topics. And thanks to our supporters and sponsors, Nod, Archicad, and uh, Mike Rusica, who's just a cool dude. <laughs> we are on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube now on occasion, depending on whether or not we feel like we want to be in front of a, in front of a camera. Um, but then we're on YouTube, right? We have a website. Yeah, we have a website. Uh, we had our first donation made, so just, just keep doing donation. <laughs> <laughs>
And obviously that money will go directly toward chocolate. My new closet. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> You're going to buy a closet? How does that even work? <laughs> no, stuff to put in my closet. Oh, okay, okay. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, no, we have a, a bunch of new stuff we want to put together for the new recording yeah. studio. So... Um, any help is much appreciated. And if you don't have any money, that's okay. You can always leave us a review on YouTube, on iTunes, uh, iTunes <coughs> Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, any platforms out there. If you leave comments about a specific episode, try to leave them where the episode is so people interested in listening to it actually see them where they're supposed to be. That's always better, I would say. But that's um, not always possible. But it's not always possible. So if it's not possible, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're just saying if it's possible, you know, okay. try to keep it tidy. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I, I don't really care. Just leave her, leave comments. I care. Okay. I, I care. Okay, good. Yeah, so we're on all the social medias. Reach out to us if you have any recommendations for things we should talk about or people that we should interview. We appreciate you listening. It means a lot to us, and it's super cool. And we will continue forward with this podcast. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we will talk to you again next week or sooner. Bye. Bye-bye.